a lot of pressure just because it's your last class. I feel like, you know, it's, it's, I have to like be uh, headline caliber, you know, something that you're, it's going to leave something very impressionable to you. So hopefully I can do that here today. Um, I guess to start, um, you know, how, how many of you, I can sort of see you, uh, I, I, I can see the group here, but um, what, how many of you are interested in potentially a career in uh, technology consulting, anything related to the stuff you've been studying in this course today? Are, are there any of you that are looking at, is, is this sort of your specialty or area of focus within your career? Just a show of hands. Show of hands, guys. In my ass. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds good. Well, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, I think, just to maybe set some context, you know, I think it's, um, when I look at where the world is today versus when I was in college and uh, graduated from grad school and started consulting back in the, the late 90s. Um, I think today is even more, there's so much more opportunity that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. I think this is a really cool space to be in. Um, I'll admit I'm completely biased because this is all I've ever done. So this is my, my entire career has been in technology and digital transformation. But I think um, it's a really, you guys are coming into this space at a really cool time because um, every organization throughout the world is somehow impacted by technology and um, certainly the, the way the world is changing today. Um, even if you just look at uh, COVID, for example, that is, that's disrupting the world and it's disrupting organizations in a, in a pretty significant way. So that's creating a lot of need for organizations to go through a digitization of some sort. Um, you've probably heard a lot about you know, supply chain issues that organizations are facing. That's another reason why organizations are sort of being forced into digital transformation, whether they like it or not. Um, and then you like it, if you look at the uh, other trend in the space right now, just at a high level before I get into the, the actual presentation, the other trend that I think is, is very favorable to this discussion today and sort of where you guys are, are focusing your, your studies and potential careers is um, just the fact that technology is moving to the cloud. And that's a very big disruptive shift. It's a, it's long term probably a good thing, but in the short term, it creates a lot of um, turmoil and it creates a lot of change for organizations. And so, I guess the reason I bring this up is there's just so much change happening in the world. Technology is changing, the world's changing at a much faster pace now than say 20 years ago. So it's just going to constantly accelerate the need for people like yourselves to come into the digital technology or digital transformation space. So I think it's a really if I were going to school today, I would absolutely uh, focus on this area. And I did not, just to be clear, I did not study this in, when I was in college. It wasn't my intent to be in this space. I sort of accidentally fell into it, but it turns out I really enjoy it. And I obviously kept doing it for 25 years so far. Um, so what I wanted to do today is um, it is uh, share with you a uh, presentation they put together that sort of covers uh, some of the industry trends in, in the future of transformation in the 2020s. Uh, first of all, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do is give you sort of a, a high level view of, of where the industry is today, where it's headed, just building on some of the things I just mentioned um, at, at a really high level and getting into some more detail here. Um, I also encourage you uh, to ask questions along the way. I, I, I think I have 30 to 40 minutes-ish to, to present, and then we let, we'll leave some time at the end. But if it turns out that you ask a lot of questions along the way and it extends the conversation, that's that's fine with me too. So I'd much rather have conversations or questions as we go, but uh, however you guys want to handle it, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with. So feel free to chime in or, you know, jump in. I, I may not be able to see you raise your hand. So if you do raise your hand, maybe just if someone could verbally tell me there's someone waiting to ask a question, um, that would be helpful. So um, just a, a bit about myself. I, I think I, I don't need to build on this a whole lot, but um, I've been doing this for 25 years. I had no intention of doing uh, technology. Quite honestly, when I went to school, when I went to uh, business school, I, I studied marketing and management, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I went back and got my MBA shortly after graduating college. And while I was getting my master's, thinking that I was going to be like a strategy consultant or an executive at some company, um, which you know, I had a very vague aspiration of what I wanted to do in business. But while I was in grad school, um, a manufacturing company here in Denver, where, where I live and where our company is based, um, it con had posted an online at our career center at, at the University of Denver, where I went to school, posted a need for an intern to come in and do some business process analysis for an ERP implementation they were doing. Um, I, knew very little about, I knew very little about ERP at the time, but I knew I really liked operations and supply chain and process improvement, that sort of stuff. So I thought it sounded like a cool internship. And I did that internship and it, um, it exposed me to ERP implementations. I got to know a lot of technology consultants that were working for that client. 
And it just turns out I really liked it. I thought it was really cool stuff. And um, I learned a lot in that internship. So I, I can't speak highly enough about the value of getting an internship because that led me to uh, Price Waterhouse. Price Waterhouse came on campus and they they recruited one person out of our graduating MBA um, class. And, and I was the one person that got hired um, at PwC. So that was a great opportunity that I would not have gotten. I'm convinced I would not have been hired by them if I hadn't had that internship that gave me some sort of foundational experience along the way in addition to the, the academic piece. Um, and then when I was at PwC, you know, I actually, at PwC wasn't sure that I wanted to do technology stuff. I was trying to move more toward the business side of things, you know, change management and strategy and things like that. But what I came to realize through my career is that there was no need to separate it. You know, you can't really separate technology from strategy, from operations, from um, technology. All that stuff is, is integrated or it should be. And so, even if you have doubts about technology or if you think you want to focus more on business or more on organizational type stuff or strategy, uh, operational type stuff, it's all very much intertwined. It's becoming more uh, integrated over the years. So it's a, that's why I think it's such an important industry. So that's how I started my career, how I got into um, where we are today. And, and now I'm the CEO of a company called Third Stage Consulting, which is a company I started a few years ago. Um, we have about 50 uh, consultants on our team. Off, we're based in Denver, but we have offices in London um, that handles all our European clients. So that we have an office in Brisbane, Australia that handles our Asia Pacific clients. And we're in the process of finalizing an office to open in uh, Cape Town, South Africa to handle our uh, African uh, clients. So we have a presence throughout the world and continue to grow very quickly. And so a lot of what I'll share today is based on it just not just my own personal consulting experience, but just what I see our teams going through and uh, experiencing with our, with our clients. So one of the big challenges with digital transformation, even though there's a lot of opportunity with technology and technology is doing really cool stuff today with you know, AI and machine learning and robotics and um, smart factories, industry 4.0. I don't know if you've studied any or some of those things or all of those things in, in this course that you're in now or in other courses, but there's a lot of techno technology out there that's pretty cool stuff. In fact, technology is changing a lot faster than organizations and people in general are able to keep up with. So the opportunity is definitely there, but that divide between what technology can do and the ability for organizations and people to keep up with the technology, that actually creates a lot of problems or tension along the way. And you know, long-term, that's probably a good thing because it kind of forces us to change and evolve and improve as organizations and as people. But navigating that short-term tension is where a lot of companies struggle. And so when I named the company Third Stage, um, it was actually a, an analogy or a reference to analogy, which is a rocket launch. So back before Elon Musk completely revolutionized the, the way rockets work, uh, rockets used to be that you'd have two stages of boosters that would get the rocket to space. And then the third stage boost would be the, um, the ultimate height and speed for that rocket. So you'd have three stages of, of a rocket launch. And so third stage is sort of that ultimate height and speed that, it, that a rocket's trying to get to. And I like the analogy for digital transformation because most organizations get stuck in one of those first two stages and very few reach that third stage of success. And so that's really what we focus on is helping clients do the things that they need to do to get to that third stage. And we help them avoid some of the common pitfalls and challenges that, that organizations run into along the way. And I'll talk about some of those things here in a minute, but that's, that's a little bit of background of um, the company third stage. And actually uh, third stage is also a reference to uh, there's a band called Boston that maybe some of your parents listen to. Maybe some of you do. I don't know, but uh, your parents probably listen. Maybe your grandparents. I don't know, depending on how, how old they are. Um, but there's a, a band called Boston from like the late 70s and 80s, and they had an album called Third Stage. And I, I'm a big rock and roll in music buff, so I, I like the fact that it also referred to a rock and roll album. So that's where the name Third Stage comes from. So I mentioned before that there's a ton of enterprise technology out there. Um, and, and again, I don't know how much of this you've studied or heard of either in this course or in other courses you're taking, but if you look at all the things that are happening in the world with internet of things and e-commerce and blockchain, cybersecurity, cloud, you know, mobile, uh, solutions, artificial intelligence, all that stuff. It, like I said, it's, it's very revolutionary. It's so different now than if I think back to when I was at in college where you are. I mean, back when I was in college where you are, technology is pretty cool, but it was just doing basic automation at that time. I mean, it was just sort of 
we were just getting into the stage of uh, the economy and the world and technology where we were just starting to pull together um, disparate operations across different organizations. Um, and it was really focused on automation and just bringing together data. Not that that's easy, not that that's basic technology, but today it's that plus all this other stuff that you see in front of you here. And so um, along with this, these opportunities comes challenges. And like I said before, that chasm between what technology can do and where organizations people are today, that chasm is growing over time. And how to close that gap is where, where companies struggle. And it's usually not because the technology is not good enough or there's not technology out there to meet an organization's needs. It's that they don't know how to close that gap and they don't know how to align the technology capabilities with their organization. And that's where uh, most organizations struggle. And that's why, quite frankly, so many large transformation projects involving technology, that's why so many of them fail. It's not because of the technology, it's usually because of the, the people process strategy um, side of things. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. So one another problem with the industry, and, and one thing you'll learn about me, and if you if you subscribe to my YouTube videos or read my blogs or anything, I, which I encourage you to do, follow me on social media, I'm on all the platforms like Instagram and TikTok and LinkedIn, YouTube, all that stuff. Um, I, so I constantly put out videos, but when you, when you see my content and when you see the way we consult with our clients, we, we are very honest and transparent. And we're also, uh, as mentioned in my introduction, because we're technology agnostic, we're not here to try to sell anyone software or any sort of technology. We're completely um, unaffiliated with, with technology providers. Um, so the reason I bring that up is because the, one of the big problems in the industry is that Technology is changing quickly, like I mentioned. Technology can do really cool stuff, like I mentioned. But the problem is that organizations that sell the software, the vendors that sell technology, usually downplay that chasm that I was talking about. They don't, or in, or in some many cases, they don't even talk about the chasm. They just talk about all the cool stuff that technology can do. And they create this vision, this sort of utopia of what an organization could do if they adopt their technology. So what it does is it creates these... Um, unrealistic expectations for organizations where they think it's going to be easy. They think it's not going to be that hard to get from point A to point B. They think it's not going to cost them that much money. They think that technology is going to solve all their problems, which it's not uh, in and of itself or by itself. It's not going to solve all of your problems. And they don't fully understand that risk to go from point A to point B in that chasm I was talking about. And probably most importantly, the biggest failure that organizations have are those last two points on the slide, which is that they uh, typically fail to address that human com component of transformation um, and that the organizational change side of it. So they, they've done, typically organizations do, do a pretty good job with deploying technology, but what they don't do well is figure out how to bring the people along uh, to, to align with the technology and to bring their operations along to align with the technology or at least to bring all those three pieces together, the operations, the people, the technology, that all has to come together. And if you don't bring it all together, it's not, it's not gonna work. So that's the, uh, some of the problems that organizations have and they, they completely underestimate how much effort and work that takes um, to do. So just talking a, a bit about some of the, the, the key industry trends as well, just some of the things we're seeing uh, in the marketplace right now, um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, book that I, or a, an ebook that I published called uh, 20 lessons from a thousand plus digital transformation. Um, and that ebook, you can, if you go to our website, which is third stage, if you spell out the word third stage dash consulting.com, um, or just Google my name, you'll find it. Um, if you go to our website though, you'll find, um, you'll find this, this book that you can download and it has a bunch of best practices and lessons learned and all kinds of stuff uh, that you know, we, want, we share about, you know, things that organizations need to know about transformation. And some of the, the highlights from that are that, I, I won't read each of these bullets to you, but some of the key things that we find are, in addition to what I just mentioned about unrealistic expectations, you know, organizations that have realistic expectations generally are gonna do better in their transformations than the ones that don't. And the reason for that is because if you underestimate how much effort something is going to take, or you underestimate the risk or the budget, you're going to end up making really bad decisions along the way. You're going to cut things that are critical to the, the success of the, of the project or the transformation. Um, I also mentioned how you, you really do need to look at the people, process, and technology side of things. And 
today organizations tend to focus too much on the technology piece. And largely it's because of what I talked about. It's changing so fast. It's so advanced. It can do so much stuff that it's really easy to, to hone in on the technology and just try to figure that out because that's a lot to do is just to figure out how the technology works. And in that process, when you add to the fact that vendors are out there selling and focusing on the software, they're forgetting the most important parts, which are the, the operational pieces and the organizational human pieces. And if we neglect either or both of those other pieces, there's no way for a transformation to succeed. It just, it just won't. You, you'll end up with technology that works really well. It does everything you wanted it to do, but your people and your operations aren't using it. It's not being integrated into the way you do business. And that's, that's a big challenge for a lot of organizations. Um, so really having realistic understanding and, and realistic expectations is important. Um, addressing the people process technology pieces are very important. And I say another thing that's really important that we haven't talked about yet is the, the alignment you have as an organization and just making sure that you're aligned on sort of where this transformation is gonna take us, what we wanna be when we grow up, um, what our priorities are, what kind of operational improvements we want to make, what our organization and roles and responsibilities are gonna look like in the future. We as organizations need to be aligned on that in order to succeed. If we're not aligned and we don't see things the same way, again, the technology is just gonna be sitting there, not adding value to the organization because we're not aligned on how we're gonna use it and how the, the business is going to run. And then the last thing I'll mention on this slide, and again, I could, you can kind of read through the bullets in more detail. I'm just trying to pick up on some of the major themes here. Another theme that we haven't really talked about is, is culture. You know, a lot of times organizations don't think about the, the culture that they have and what the right solution is for them or the right approach to digital transformation based on their culture. Um, for example, there's companies out there, if I give you two extreme examples, you have some companies that are like smaller startup tech companies, for example, they're very um, nimble, they move fast, they're entrepreneurial, it's typically a younger workforce. Um, that culture is gonna be very different than say a company like Rochester Gas and Electric. That's a client that I did uh, client work for early in my career. So I've spent a lot of time in Rochester, uh, including during the, the cold windy winters in Rochester. Um, but one thing, I, the reason I bring up Rochester Gas and Electric is because that's an example of sort of the other extreme, which is a very established company, highly regulated, highly tenured workforce, uh, pretty risk adverse, partly because of their government regulations, but partly because it's a big deal if your power goes out or your gas goes out. So they have to be risk adverse to some way. They have to focus on stability and that sort of thing. So you look at those two examples, those are two very different companies of the high tech, small startup, and then you've got a, a old school established mature company. Those are two very different cultures and those are probably gonna look like two very different digital transformation paths. And so what organizations don't do well generally and what software vendors don't do well generally is sort of tailor or customize a, an approach for those different types of cultures because they, they need to look different. Uh, the high-tech startups probably gonna take more of an agile approach. They're probably gonna implement quickly. Their people are probably gonna adapt faster. They're probably gonna be willing to take risks and make mistakes along the way. Whereas the RG&E example is they're probably gonna take longer to go through a similar transformation. They're probably gonna go slower, more measured, uh, multiple phases. They're probably gonna be a lot harder to change, which they were because they were one of the early clients I worked with. They were, it was very difficult to change, partly because they're unionized too. That's another um, factor you have to look at. Um, and so that even if they wanted to change, you have unions to deal with that uh, don't always necessarily allow you to change. Um, so, the, so that's just two extreme examples of how you have to define a transformation strategy and roadmap that fits your culture. And, and most organizations don't think about that. And that's part of what we, we help our clients do. So those are some of the, the, the keys to transformation success, um, and hopefully I've hit on some of the, the major themes uh, from this slide. Let me stop there for a second. Are there, are there questions so far? Any, any thoughts or questions on what I've covered so far? Yes, Jessica. Um, I just have a question. So you're like said a lot about like the culture and like keeping everybody aligned, like on the same things. How do you enforce that like in your business? Because I know there's a lot of like different engagements from like other countries and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So the way we do that is we'll, um, when we go into new clients, we'll do an organizational assessment 
And it's uh, partly based on quantitative data we gather through surveys, online surveys. And it's also partly based on uh, qualitative data that we gather through focus groups. And we'll ask questions about the culture and the way the company works and um, the way different departments communicate with one another, what some of the differences in culture are throughout the organization, because bigger organizations don't usually have just one culture. Usually there's a lot of subcultures, especially in multinational situations and or situations where the company has grown through mergers and acquisitions, you're gonna have multiple cultures within the same company. So we do those organizational assessments to really understand the culture so that we can sort of understand how hard is this change gonna be for this organization? Um, and also, you know, how quickly are they realistically gonna change? And also we have to look at, um, we have to understand based on, based on the, uh, if we go back to the RG&E versus tech startup example, um, how, how much of a risk or how big of a change are they really willing to make? Technology might be way over here that allows you to change dramatically, but if you're a risk adverse company over here, you're not gonna make that jump overnight or even in three or five years. You're, you're probably gonna make more measured incremental changes, but the tech startup might be willing to swing for the fences and jump straight over to that, that big massive change. So the way we assess all that though is through that organizational um, assessment. And then based on our analysis and results from that, then we sort of, um, first of all, we create a change management strategy based on the, those results, but it also influences or informs our overall uh, digital transformation plan overall, just because it, that needs to align with the findings from that, from that uh, organizational cultural assessment. So does that answer your question, Jessica, or is there more to that? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Great. Sure. Emma. So could you explain more on being technology agnostic? I know you do advise clients on a lot of technology. So could you just explain on like what that exactly like means for you and for your consulting program? Yeah, actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to, this is driving me crazy that I can't see you guys very well. So I'm going to try and blow up my, my screen here. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. I won't make you repeat that just because I couldn't see you. But um, so you, but you are asking, um, how maybe I will ask you to re rephrase that. So the technology you're asking about being technology agnostic and yeah. what that means or, or what? What exactly that means for you? Because I'm not sure. I'm pretty confused. So if you could explain on that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So what it means is when we go into like, let me back up. If, if I were a software vendor or if I were a consultant that represented or specialized in just one type of software and you're a CEO or CIO of an organization, you come to me and say, Hey, I need, I need new technology to help grow my business or to solve problems, A, B, and C. I'm going to tell you the answer that I already have prepared, which is I sell you this sort of software, this one type of software. Um, that's not what we do because we don't sell software. And we also don't specialize in any one software, uh, both vendor specific, but also the types of software too. So for example, if you're that same CEO or CIO that comes to me and says, um, what, um, you know, what, what kind of technology is best going to solve my problems? I'm going to look at the entire landscape of options out there. It might be an ERP system. It might be CRM or HCM. It could be, you know, business intelligence. It could be some sort of combination of all of the above. It could be robotics. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff that, a lot of different technologies that might help you solve that problem. So because we're not selling software, we'll make the recommendation just based on what we think makes sense. We'll help a client um, negotiate and procure that software. And then we'll ultimately will help them implement whatever software that is. It will also help them through the operational improvements and the organizational improvements that go along with that. Thank you. Carlos. Uh, so before you start like working with a, with an organization and you're like taking into account their culture and like their processes and all of that, do you ever like have to kind of like turn down working with them because it doesn't match your culture or like. Ooh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I've never been asked that before. Um, you know, the short answer is not typically, I mean, 99% of the time, no, we're, we're used to working with all different types of, of cultures and, and companies. Um, in fact, as a consultant, you kind of have to be a chameleon. I mean, the more you can be a chameleon and fit into different, cultures and understand those cultures and empathize with them, the better consultant you're going to be. So yes, you know, third stage, I think we have a very distinct and strong culture. And that's something that was really important to me when I started the company is to create our culture, but our culture is very different from most clients we work with. So if we, you know, if we excluded too many, we, we wouldn't be in business, but 
having said what having said that though there's there have been a handful of situations that i can recall where we in hindsight we probably should have turned away the business because it was such a cultural difference that we just weren't a good fit to work with them so you know you can be a chameleon you can fit in but there's going to be times where it's just it's too much of a stretch and you know there's just too much of a, a divide so it's rare but um at, it's rare that that happens but you know the better consultant you are the less the less that's going to happen because you you know how to not that you have to just conform to everything, but you just need to understand it. it and it's not our job, by the way, to judge a, a organizational culture and say that's right or wrong or good or bad. It's just to state the facts and say you are risk adverse. Let's say we're not saying that's good or bad, but you're risk adverse. So that means you need to think about this transformation in this way versus that, you know, a less risk adverse company. Thank you. Haley. Um, so going back to like unrealistic expectations with companies. How do you like tell them that like what they're looking for? Like, how do you just tell them that like it, it won't work or like, I don't know, I guess like how do you tell a company that what they want isn't going to be like what they need, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, you know, you have to do it with uh, finesse. I'd say you can't just come out and say, you're totally thinking about this wrong and you're going to fail if you do this and this and that. Um, but what we, what we do do is try to, you know, there's ways you can do it by sharing experiences, you know, like you're, you're thinking about going down this path. Um, you can give a case study that says we had a client that was similar to that. Here's what happened. Here's some of the things they struggled with. That's one way. So you're sort of deflecting from them personally and focusing on another organization that's similar to them and they'll connect the dots themselves and say, oh, okay, so I'm doing things wrong or, or maybe I shouldn't do things that way. And the other ways, you know, that I like to do personally, and, and I encourage our team to do is just ask questions, like, instead of saying, hey, you're wrong, you're going to screw this up. Um, you'll ask a question like, have you thought about this? Or what do you think would happen if you did this, this and that? Um, and you if you can guide them, the, the best thing to do as a consultant is not to ever have to give them the, the hard message, if you don't have to, if you can get them to come to that conclusion themselves, that's even more powerful. Uh, partly because you're not creating that adversarial defensiveness that might come along with that, but also because then they they own that. It, it's their decision. It's their conclusion. It's not some outside consultant that came in and gave them the answer. And that's the ideal thing to do as a consultant. And I think something that really good consultants, the best consultants can do is they get the clients to come to their own conclusions that are the right ones for them without you having to sort of be a sledgehammer or a wrecking ball coming in to you know, give, deliver bad news. But there are times where you have to do that either way, though. So, you know, I don't want to say you never have to do that, but you, you, if you can minimize it, that's even better. Uh, we have some more questions. You know, if you want to go ahead and um, close your screen share, you might be able to see us better. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, uh, and actually, I've enlarged you separately, so I can, I can do ah, okay. Does that work? Does it work better for you if I shut it down or what? Uh, either way. Okay. I'll just leave it open for now. So other questions we've got, um, Matt. So when you're early in the relationship with a client and you're doing the surveys and the focus groups, are there uh, factors that you typically look at to say, okay, now I'm thinking this uh, piece of software might be a good fit this one wouldn't be a good fit and what are those factors that you typically run into sure well the start it's um a lot of the the intangible stuff that i mentioned before like the the culture of the organization uh the strategic goals and objectives of the organization if they're you know if they're a really high growth company that's that's going through aggressive growth uh, versus a more a larger more established company that's just looking for more incremental growth that's going to lead you to different technologies or different types of technologies. Um, you also look at where the pains are, you know, what are the things are really struggling with? If it's a, a customer facing problem, like the, the, their customer service is failing or their, um, their on-time deliveries are, are suffering, um, that's going to lead you down a different path than an organization that is just having trouble with their uh, financial consolidation and financial reporting. You know, those are two, those are just different problems you're trying to solve. So there's sort of the high level, uh, big picture, intangible uh, parameters that you, you focus on. But then when we, we get down into the details of an organization's operations, their, their detailed business processes and workflows, that's going to lead you to different pain points and problems you're trying to solve. And it's going to lead you to a set of business requirements that you can then prioritize and then evaluate potential 
uh, potential technologies. But there's a lot of, so there's a combination of art and science to that because we have a database with quantitative data that shows the functional strengths and weaknesses of all the different technologies out there. But we don't want to be out there looking at one or 200 different technologies for one client. We need to know enough to be able to narrow that down quickly to you know a handful that we can then continue to narrow down from there. So it's a combination of quantitative and qualitative stuff, a combination of strategic intangibles along with more tangible operational stuff that we look at as well. Hey, Jason. Um, so I've been wondering like, so when you engage in other countries, like, and they usually speak in a different language, do you, would you guys have like, uh, work with like some sort of translator or have someone in your team to be a translator? Yeah, we, yes, to both. So we have, for example, we just started doing work with a new client in uh, Latin America and they have, uh, they operate in seven or eight different countries in Latin America. I, I myself don't speak Spanish and a lot of our team doesn't speak Spanish, but we do have team members that are bilingual um, and, and the, the project lead, the senior manager that's managing that project is bilingual. Um, she's actually from that region, lives in the United States now. Um, but so we have her leading the project so she can speak both languages. And we also have a translator that's more to help translate deliverables and work outputs that we create. You know, she's there to help create it in the, the local language. So it's usually a combination of both. Uh, a lot of a lot of places, though, like in the um, especially like in the Middle East and Africa uh, in even parts of Europe. You know, a lot of the world, it's always fascinating. A lot of the world will, will, will do business in English, you know, at least uh, at the strategic level. When you get into implementations and you start to train people on new technologies, that's where the translation becomes really important because at the executive level, mid-level management at most of these big companies, they most of them speak English. Uh, but when you get to the front line, like shop floor workers, warehouse workers, things like that, a lot of times, um, even in largely English speaking countries, they, they don't speak English well, or they, they prefer their local language. So that's where it becomes more important is during the implementation of technology for sure. Okay, did I see something up front? Yeah, Amelia. Um, how do you help a company define success in their ERP selection and implement, implementation? Ah, great question. So you know, in selection, I guess it's hard to measure success during selection because you don't really know if you've made the right decision until you get to implementation. But um, what we do, you know, our, our process is pretty rigorous to where I don't want to say you're guaranteed the right answer, but it's going to lead you to a path to a technology or a set of technologies that's going to be pretty darn close to what you need. You know, it may not be a perfect fit. It may not give you everything an organization wants, but you're going to get pretty close. Um, so I don't want to be too dismissive of that part of it, but I'd say the more important thing to measure success on is the, the implementation. That's where most companies screw it up. I, I don't think most organizations, even if they're not working with us, quite frankly, or they don't hire a consultant, most of the time they can get pretty close, you know, in terms of what the right technology is, but where they mess up is, is how to implement it and how to, um, you know, go through that entire journey. So during implementation though, um, there's a few different ways to measure. I mean, obviously there's the sort of the basic, on time, on budget sort of metrics, you know, did we implement in the, in the amount of time and money that we said we would, but the really important metrics, and, and by the way, those are the metrics that most organizations focus on. Did we implement on time, on budget? And I'd say those are the least important metrics because the bigger and more material metrics that companies should be looking at, um, and if they don't, they end up in trouble, is uh, if you look at operational disruption, you know, what level of operational disruption do we have at the time that we flip the switch and turn on new technology? Because if you can't ship product or you can't close the books or your customers are getting pissed off because uh, you're not able to service them, then you've got a real problem. And that cost usually uh, is exponentially greater than any cost of implementation in the time uh, affiliated with that. And then the other set of metrics would be sort of the longer term business value. You know, even if you implement it on time on budget, you didn't screw things up at go live. The third set of metrics would then say, did you uh, get the business value that you expected? You know, you invested $10 million in this transformation. What did you get for it? And it's, it, it's completely fascinating and baffling to me how few organizations care about that. They'll spend millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions of dollars, some extreme cases, hundreds of millions of dollars on these transformations. And they don't, they can't point to tangible business benefits that they got from it. 
And to me, you know, it's easy for me to say as a consultant, I suppose, but to me, that's unacceptable. I don't think any organization should accept that, but it, it's the way they think. I, I'm not sure why. And it, it hasn't changed much in the, the time I've been doing this either. So that's the bad news. I'll try to, I'll try to keep it more positive than that uh, throughout this conversation. <laughs> so, uh, do you have several more slides for us? I do. Yeah, a handful. Um, okay. We have some keep... more questions, but let's go ahead and move forward and we'll come back to those questions in a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. So what I was talking about here on this slide were the keys to success, but then what are those failure red flags? What are the things that could be uh, creating problems or challenges? Um, so some of the things or warning signs to watch for when an organization is going through them is if you have, if you're too aggressive or overly ambitious or unrealistic on your time, budget, and cost, that's a problem. If you don't have a clear vision and you haven't clearly defined what you want your operations to look like in the future, that that's a problem because it's a lot, it's a lot like building a house. If you build a house, um, you're not just going to have a bunch of contractors show up and start building stuff. You're going to have to have a blueprint. You need to have a design for what you want it to look like. Now, the problem, again, this is where the industry, I, I do call out our industry a lot because our industry creates a lot of these problems themselves. We, we bring this on ourselves. The problem is software vendors come in and try to sell you on the concept that you don't need to worry about your business processes and defining what you want to be when you grow up because our technology will solve all those problems for you. you just buy the technology now and worry about your processes later. And that's the exact opposite of what organizations should be doing. But the reality is if I'm a sales rep and I'm going to make a lot of money by selling our g &E, new technology, I'm going to tell them what they want to hear. And I'm probably going to say the things I need to say to get them to sign on the dotted line now versus three or six months from now after they've defined all their processes and work through their uh, sort of what they want to be when they grow up phase of things. But the right answer for most organizations is to, is to do that. So there's a, there's a conflict or a misalignment between vendors, self-interest and what organizational interests are. Um, so having that business operations inside up front is important. Um, not having clearly defined contracts, not managing the vendors well. Um, one dynamic we commonly see that leads to failure is organizations say, well, we don't know this stuff but you do, you're the consultants or you're the software vendor. So we're just going to sort of let you run this thing. Um, that's a terrible idea. And that I don't know that I've ever seen that go well uh, or even close to well. Um, you need to own that. You know, organizations need to own their transformations. They have to be the ones to manage their vendors, manage the project, make sure that they're pivoting and adjusting however they need to. Um, when you just so many big companies, especially they defer to these big consulting firms and let them do everything. And, and I used to work for one, this is how I know, and you see it all the time even now. When I was at Price Waterhouse, we had like 40, 40 or 45 people on the first project I was on, they were full-time on this project. And there was times where I just didn't have, you know, I, I didn't have enough work to fill up, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week of my time, but my partner and leadership expected me to bill 50 to 60 hours a week. And so I'd be billing 50 to 60 hours a week, like begging and scrounging for work to do but it's all about maximizing revenue. And that was a big revenue stream for that, that, um, for that uh, company that I work for. And that, you know, that just happened repeatedly through my career. I see it all the time with our clients now that hire those big system integrators. So, you know, it's up to the organizations though. You could blame the consulting firms all you want, but really it's the organizations that hired those consultants in the first place and don't manage them. That's, that's their problem. They need to fix that. Um, so that's something that the organizations need to work on. Um, lack of planning. Um, is another big challenge. Companies that just jump in and start doing stuff, they just start implementing technology. Those companies are not generally going to succeed. The exception might be that example I gave earlier of the small, high growth, nimble tech startup type company. They're probably going to do okay with that because that's probably how they operate in general. So they'll take like that agile approach. They'll start building stuff. They'll test it. They'll fail. They'll fix it. That's okay for that type of company. But if you're a big, massive, mature company, that's going to be very disruptive. That same approach is going to be very disruptive to, to a bigger company. So um, you just have to have a, a, a plan and a strategy that's aligned with who you are as a company. Um, just some other things, you know, not having thought through what the transition will entail. You know, we organizations focus so much on just getting the technology to work and then training people on how to use technology. That's sort of the, the basic mindset, but there's so much more to it. I mean, when you, when you deploy a new technology, for example, oftentimes you're automating people's jobs and you're taking away things that they used to do. So if, if, if I'm someone that uh, used to use 
uh, spreadsheets. I would enter data into spreadsheets and run all these macros and do all this analysis in my spreadsheets. Now you're going to give me a new ERP system that can automate all that for me. And you just took away half my job. Let's just say we as an organization have to define, well, what am I going to do with my other half of my time? Um, partly so that you have a vision for what the organization is going to look like, but also partly so I don't freak out and start to resist the change because I'm just now realizing that half my job is going to go away. So therefore I'm going to try and push back on this, on these changes because I don't want half my job to go away or worse yet, I don't want to get downsized. So you have to, those are the sorts of dynamics that organizations don't often enough look at. And, and that's part of why we help so much with, with change management uh, during these. Um, and then I'd say, you know, the, the other thing I'll point out here is just the lack of risk, risk management. Uh, risk management is really important as far as being able to anticipate, identify, and mitigate uh, risks along the way. Um, and the better you can do that, uh, the, the more likely you are to succeed. And every, every project is going to have significant risks uh, during their transformation. The problem is when they don't, when organizations and their consulting partners don't see the risks or they don't do anything about the risk, or they just assume the risk will just go away and it's not a big deal because usually they, they are a big deal. And then um, I have just a couple more slides and then we can sort of open it up to more uh, questions and conversation. But this is a, a high level slide. And we actually have a more detailed version of this um, out on our website. And I actually share it in my social media um, and our team shares it in social media as well. But it's uh, this is sort of a summary of a slide that identifies the major things that we would do to define a, a client's in an organization's digital strategy. And if you look at it, I won't walk through each box, but you look at the five or six major work streams running across the, the slide here, you can see that in order to be successful, you have to focus on business processes. You need to look at your organizational change strategy. How are we gonna uh, identify what the change impacts are and how are we gonna ensure that people are able to make those changes? Um, how do we ensure that we find the right technologies to fit their needs? How do we ensure that we address that solution architecture piece, which is how do you tie together multiple systems or multiple technologies? Because usually it's not as simple as deploying an ERP system, and that's just going to automate everything. It's going to be all integrated. Typically, you're integrating to other third-party systems, or even within that one ERP system, oftentimes you have to create an integration plan between different modules uh, for some of the bigger systems. And then business intelligence and analytics too. What, you know, what are we going to get out of these systems? What kind of visibility do we need? What kind of reporting and analytics do we need? A lot of organizations may implement technology that automates the business and improves efficiency, but they don't have the right visibility into, you know, what is our work in progress or, you know, what's our average on time rate, delivery rate, real time. And so just getting that real time data and insights into the business is really important too. And that's, it's a lost opportunity for a lot of organizations that spend all this money on technology, but they can't get the data out of the system and the insights out of the system to be able to make better decisions. And then finally, there's that project quality assurance piece that, you know, that's more of a general project management and program controls along the way. So the last thing I'll cover here is just some of the trends and the future of digital transformation in the, in the 2020s. Um, I've, I've actually updated this list for 2022, uh, just very recently. Um, so if you go out to my uh, YouTube channel and subscribe to it, you'll see that I have my predictions for 2022 out there as well. But some of the themes are similar, you know, from 2021 to now 2022. Um, but some of the big trends we're seeing are the acceleration of cloud adoption, especially in light of the COVID world. Um, just it, the, the fact that there were so many disruptions operationally and organizationally to so many companies throughout the world, it exposed a lot of deficiencies in those organizations' systems. And it sort of forced this a further acceleration of the shift to the cloud because cloud systems will better support you know, hybrid work environments and dispersed work environments, uh, which is what we're seeing more of today. Um, the other part of that too, the other reason or the other driver of that acceleration of cloud, quite frankly, is largely driven by money and economics. Um, software vendors make a lot more money on cloud subscriptions than they do uh, one-time software sales. Investors love it because it's very predictable. Their stock price will do better the higher their um, cloud adoption rates are. In fact, if you look anytime Oracle uh, or SAP, particularly Oracle, anytime they come out their quarterly earnings, there's a huge focus on how much of that revenue, how much of that profit came from cloud versus other you know, non-cloud solutions. And when the cloud numbers higher, the stock market will shoot or the stock price will shoot up. Investors get excited. But if the number is soft or doesn't seem as strong as investors expect, 
they get hammered in their stock price. It's fascinating. So it all starts there, in my opinion. That's how this whole cloud thing started. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna argue that cloud is not a good thing in general, but I think the real reason why vendors are pushing it so hard is because they make more money and the investors love it. So you've got those two factors of play, money and then the economy and you know just the world changing the way it is with COVID especially is creating the need for more cloud technology, which there are definite risks to cloud as well, which we could talk about some other time, but a lot of organizations don't recognize or identify what those risks are. Uh, machine learning and AI are things that two, three, five years ago was just sort of a pipe dream. You know, you talk about it, it existed, but we weren't seeing any real world application of it for the most part for, for most mainstream organizations. But now we are starting to see that. It's becoming more and more common that, that we actually are able to leverage machine learning and AI. Um, risk mitigation, you know, the companies that can mitigate risk better are the ones that are going to succeed more. The ones that can uh, retain their flexibility and be more nimble, especially in this post-COVID world, you have to be able to adjust quickly as an organization. So even the old school, slow moving organizations are finding that they have to figure out a way to become more, more nimble. And the one thing that's not changing is the human side. Uh, at the end of the day, technology is changing a lot faster than people are. We as humans just don't change as fast as uh, the technology we create, ironically. Um, so that's something that really hasn't changed much in my career is the humans and organizational changes have not become easy, any easier. In fact, I'd say it's getting harder, partly because of that divide I talked about, the, the divides getting greater between technology and where we are today. So that's what I've got for you as far as prepared materials. So why don't I just open up to continuing general discussion or general questions that you guys might have. Okay, uh, Shidan. Uh, so I have a question about like when you're initially consulting with like an organization, has there been times where you guys can't really come to like a conclusion, like either they don't like your solution or you don't, I guess, can't work with them or something similar? Yeah, there's been times where they don't like the, the solution or the advice that we give them. Um, it's sort of like the question before of, you know, do you, do you ever turn away business because of the culture is too different? It's similar to that uh, sort of theme. Um, but, you know, what you have to do as a consultant, though, is you, you, you have to handle any sort of recommendation, especially when it's a difficult recommendation. You have to handle it with finesse, and it's a lot easier said than done, but you can't come in, you know, you can't come in too hot, you know, with, with a, like, hey, you guys are all screwed up. Here's what you need to do to fix it. You have to work, you have to collaborate and, and again, help them come to that conclusion themselves um, as much as you can. Um, the bigger challenge though, is when I think the hardest part in what we do uh, that relates to your question is that when, a, when we're helping a client through a process and then the software vendors come in and give a completely different answer. Um, and it's the answer that helps them sell software. So for example, if we say, Hey, um, we think for you to go through a transformation is going to take you three years, uh, because you're a big company and whatever your culture suggests that it's going to take longer. But then a software vendor comes in and says, Oh, it's not going to take you three years. We can do this in 12 to 18 months. Um, that's the hard part because it, the 12 to 18 months is what most people want to hear. Um, but we're telling them what the reality is. And so that part's really difficult, but usually I think we're doing a better job over time of sort of setting those expectations with clients to help them prepare for, here's what you're going to hear from the vendors. Um, and then when they do hear it, they kind of know, and they're not surprised that they're coming in with a different answer. So that's, that's our strategy to deal with that. But that's probably the point in our, in our, uh, in our entire realm of consulting that we have the most trouble with is that is that early phase where they're about to start an implementation. Okay, Emma. So my question is sort of related to Siobhan's. What, so have you ever had a case where despite all the, of the consulting you did and all of the advice and strategies you made, um, the company still followed that, but it wasn't working for them? Um, and how did you work around that? Yeah, great question. Because as much as I'd love to tell you that um, all of our clients are perfect and they're super happy and everything's gone perfectly because they hired third stage, that's not true. Um, and there are, uh, there are, I think the hardest part of being a consultant in general is that we're, we're outside consultants. We're not decision makers. So we can tell our clients all we want. Hey, you know, have you thought about A, B, and C? Um, sometimes they're going to flat out say, yeah, we have, but we're willing to take that risk or, you know, we, we hear what you're saying. We know it's a risk, but we're, we're comfortable moving ahead anyway. 
and you know, as a consultant, if we if we were to judge them and say, oh, well, you didn't listen to us, we're out of here, um, we, you know, we wouldn't be in business very long. So what we have to do at that point is then sort of we stay on the journey with them and we'll advise them, okay, you're doing this, here's the risk. Now let's figure out how we're going to mitigate that risk, which you know, we're not going to argue with them on whether or not they should have gone down this path or not. We're not going to tell them, see, we told you so, you know, in a year from now when it blows up in their face, that's not what we do, but sometimes it does blow up in their face. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a tough balancing act, to be honest. It's a great question. Um, and it's one of the dynamics to think about. If you're thinking about being a consultant, the, one of the frustrating things for a lot of people, including myself, is that I love consulting. I love giving advice. I love problem solving but sometimes clients don't listen and they do their own thing. And part of it's because they don't want to hear it. But a lot of times, you know, I, you have to empathize with them. A lot of times they're making tough decisions themselves. They don't have time. They don't have the resources to do everything you're telling them they need to do. So they have to make these tough trade-offs that they know in some cases might be escalating the risk, but that's the reality of their business. So, and then what, then our job becomes, okay, well, let's give in those parameters and given where we're headed. Now let's figure out how to make this client as successful as we possibly can. And usually we can do a pretty good job at that. Sometimes though, the decisions are just so far off that, you know, they still may run into some pretty significant trouble. That's not common, but that does happen occasionally. Okay, um, Matthew. Um, so what made you decide that you wanted to own your own uh, company instead of working for another large consulting business? And what did it take for you to start your own company? Well, um, Good question. Part of part of why I did it was partly because I don't like being told what to do, um, to be honest. But the other the other part of it is the bigger part of it is that I had worked at these big companies, and I saw um, I, I saw a lot of un, really unhealthy behavior in, in, for early from early in my career. Going back to that example of not having enough work to fill my plate, but yet still being expected to bill a certain number of hours. There's a lot of ethical lapses in this industry. I think it's a highly unethical industry, if I'm going to be candid. Um, I think the software um, community is, is they, they're good at developing software, but they're, the ethics are very questionable at best. So I wanted to start a company that was independent, that not that we can completely get away from that, but we can be untethered and not driven by selling software. Because I think that leads to better behavior and better decision-making for clients when we can be, uh, you know, have a fresh set of eyes and not be self-motivated to sell more software. So that was probably the biggest thing is just the ethics of it and wanting to create a disruptive, different company that didn't really exist in, in the space at the time. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Kara. Um, following up on like Matthew's question, like when you first started your consulting firm, like what were some of the biggest challenges and how did you like build your like prospect for like new clients and like build your company? Yeah, so um, this is actually the second uh, consulting company I started. I started one called Panorama Consulting back in 2005, and I ran that company till 2018. And then 2018, I split away from Panorama to start uh, Third Stage. So I've done it twice in, um, in, in the same industry. The first time when I was at Panorama, I was 32 years old when I started that company. Um, clearly, at that age, I had all the answers. I knew everything, just like a lot of you might know everything at this point, but yet I didn't. Um, so I didn't really know what I was doing, honestly, when I started uh, Panorama, but so I didn't have like a, a huge amount of experience. I didn't have a big Rolodex of contacts that I could go sell to. So what I did was I, I created a, a blog as, as simple as it sounds back in 2005, not a lot of, there weren't a lot of business to business sort of blogs, especially in the technology space. So I was one of the first bloggers in the space and I started writing a blog and it got a lot of traction, a lot of attention. And that gave us the exposure to really get that company off the ground. Um, and then I brought on a couple of business partners, long story short, didn't go well. And that's what uh, that uh, caused me to, to, to leave the company and start uh, third stage. So when I started third stage, I knew I couldn't just copy what I had just done at Panorama, just do that all over again. So, and plus times had changed by then. There was tons of blogs out there. People had already figured out SEO and all the Google stuff, you know, the ways to get ranked higher in Google. So um, I just decided, well, why not start some videos? And so I I already had had a YouTube channel that I barely put any videos on, but I just started creating some videos thinking that that might give me some more exposure. And so um, that was, that was the, you know, really what helped us get going. And it actually, to this day, it's our biggest source of new business is my YouTube channel. 
uh, in the third stage YouTube channel as well. But I what I would say, if you want to be a consultant, though, whether you want to start your own company or even if you want to work at a, at a bigger firm, just positioning yourself as a, a thought leader and sharing your knowledge is one of the best things you can do. Uh, because there's times where I feel like I'm just saying stuff that everyone already knows, but apparently they don't, you know, because they like the videos, they consume it, they, you know, I get good feedback on it. In fact, I remember the first few videos I did, I thought this isn't going to go well. I, people aren't going to watch this. Why would they watch this? You know, because to me, it felt like just real basic. I'm just talking, but people like them a lot. So, um, so you just have to put your knowledge out there and give knowledge back. And you want clients and potential clients to see that you're credible. Um, they trust you. You know what you're talking about. You know, if they can see that ahead of time, um, that makes that makes it a lot easier to to get new business. Okay, um, Teresa, how do you find success as a small consulting firm? And like, do you have like, is it a very competitive industry with other consulting firms? Like when finding like a client? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it's highly fragmented. The industry is highly fragmented. So there's a lot of, you have a lot of like big consulting firms like Accenture and Deloitte and those guys that have hundreds of thousands of uh, consultants on their team. Uh, you have a lot of mid-tier clients and then you have a ton of just solo one man one woman type shops that are just out on their own doing consulting um but that's part of our uh part of our strategy is not to compete directly with most of the industry is to create this this niche i don't know if it, for any of your school or interest you've read a book called um what's it called blue ocean strategy i think is what it's called um it's a really good book if you haven't read it it's, it's a, if you like business strategy type stuff it's really good but the whole idea is you 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 can fight in the really competitive part of the ocean where everyone's killing each other, or you can move over to the blue ocean where there's not a lot of competition. And I think that's what we've done is not that there's no competition, but there's less competition for what we do because most, you know, probably 99% or more of the industry is, is not independent. They're affiliated with a software vendor and they're trying to sell software in some way, whereas we're not. So we sort of created our own niche. So I don't want to say it's easy, but that helps. And then the type of thought leadership we do with the videos and that sort of thing, it, seems like a lot of other companies have trouble replicating that or they haven't figured it out yet and it just creates a certain amount of trust and credibility that makes it easier for us to to find new clients i'd say than compared to most companies our size Karina, oh do you actually have any examples of projects or systems that you've worked on for clients and how they use it into their current system like how they how they used it with their current system or how they just integrated this new system to become their current system? How they, how they integrated the system to their new system. Yeah, so um, there've been times where, where parts of an organization will deploy new technology, but the other parts of the organization will keep some of their old technology and then they'll integrate it together. Um, that's actually fairly common, especially in the interim as companies are going through transformations because they have to um, figure out a way to, to bring together uh, or they, they've got to figure out a way to transition all those different systems over time so that in the interim, they have to tie together those systems. Um, but once it becomes integrated into the operations, it uh, becomes a lot easier for them to, you know, if, when you see them do it in a way that's become seamless and they've actually operationalized the new technology, um, yeah, there's a lot of examples of, of those. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure that I'm, I don't feel like I'm fully answering what you asked. Um, I was actually wondering if you could give us examples of projects you worked on with other companies. Yeah, hopefully we can get that. Yeah. Okay. So where we worked with other companies? Like? Or worked with your clients? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not understanding the question. Are you looking for some examples of clients they've done projects with? Yeah. Oh, just in general or, okay. I'm sorry. I was, I was making it more complicated than it was. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, um, there's a lot, let's see. Um, some of the recent bigger, well-known, better known clients would be um, like Simplot Foods, which is a big uh, food company. Uh, they make, they're known for, they're best known for making uh, the, the, French fries for McDonald's, but they also do all kinds of other food. Uh, we worked with another food company in France called Bonduelle. They're Europe, Europe's biggest uh, food manufacturer. Um, we, um, we've done work with uh, Mass Mutual, which is a big financial services firm out your way of uh, 
sort of your way in, in Boston. Um, what else? And, and by the way, I should have introduced her from the start. Kyler Cheatham is on the, the other, the third camera here, this random person that people maybe wonder <laughs> who she is. She's actually our marketing director at third stage. So I guess better late than never, but Kyler, I don't know if you have any, in addition to introducing you belatedly, do you, can you think of other uh, examples of recent clients? I'm running yeah. out of um, I mean, we we are big in the steel industry, as Eric mentioned in the beginning. So the biggest global steel manufacturer, um, Nucor, we work with. Um, and they're a great example of a totally different culture within each project we work with. So when we engage in a, a new um, a new piece of business with them, it's oftentimes a completely different team and a completely different culture that we then integrate in. So a great question to kind of follow up on how do we diversify the companies we work with. A lot of times it can be that just one company is very different and has all of these different subcultures. But thank you for letting me join as well too. Um, so. Yes, thank you. Thanks for bailing me out on that one, Kyle. <laughs> no. I don't know why I We've worked with over, uh, over 100, maybe 150 different clients in the last three years. Um, and a lot of them you've never heard of. That's the interesting thing about what we do too, is you learn, you learn so much about so many different industries that you didn't know existed and so many companies that you can't believe, you know, are generating hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue in this really niche industry. Um, so you, you do learn a lot about companies and industries that aren't commonly known. Okay, we have time for just a couple more questions, uh, Carlos. Uh, when, uh, when an organization isn't willing to like, Put the necessary budget to, into their digi digital transformation do you like usually either like try to come up with a cheaper option or like either be like it's like this or nothing kind of it's it's more the first of what you said it's more you know let's figure out if, if your budget is you know 30 percent less than what we think it's going to take to do it right then let's figure out what you realistically can do for 30 percent less it may it may be that you cut uh, scope. You know, a lot of times you, you say, okay, well, you can't implement for that price. You can't really effectively implement across your entire organization. So maybe we pick out certain modules. Maybe we start with financials and accounting and inventory management and whatever, you know, you kind of pick the modules and maybe we leave out CRM and human capital management and, um, you know, the, some of the cool AI stuff that the system can do. Maybe we put that on the back burner and just get the basics in place. But Generally, we try to recommend to our clients that you're better off erring on the side of a smaller scope, knowing that you've got some buffer and you're not trying to do too much with too little resources. Um, and usually clients will listen to that. I mean, it's, it's rare that they, they go all or nothing unless they, um, I, again, back to the ethics of our industry, the big system integrators are horrible at managing expectations and they would try to force fit everything they could into that 30% shortfall that I mentioned and they would probably mismanage the expectations that you could still do everything, but for 30% less, uh, because they know that over time, they're probably gonna end up paying at least 30% or more, you know, they're gonna go over budget and they're gonna benefit from that when they do go over budget. So that's the dynamic that uh, the industry struggles with. Hey, Matt, when you work with large, um, like multinational companies, do you assign, or do you have just one of your offices work with that company or, like the companies across like the U.S. and in the U.K., will you have both of your U.S. and U.K. offices work with that company or will mm -hmm. you just have one run point? No, we, we cross pollinate uh, quite a bit, especially during COVID. We accelerated that trend just because we, we could, you know, because everyone was working remote anyway. So it didn't matter where they were. Um, but it's also a good way for us to manage the ebbs and flows of the different offices. So when, you know, the billable revenue gets a little soft in one region, there's usually you know, one of the other regions can usually pick up the slack. Plus our people like it. You know, I, I like it. I like doing international stuff. And most people on our team want to be involved with other regions and learn about different parts of the world and whatnot. So, and I tend to want to hire people that are, that think that way too. Hey, Haley, did you still have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, so you said that like, you don't make decisions for companies, but say they like make the wrong decision in a way. Like, does that ever have like a negative effect on your company or does that like, how does that like affect your company? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, it's hard because you, you know, you have to, again, you have to respect and empathize with the fact that they, businesses have their own parameters, their own pressures, their own, uh, 
restrictions and limitations on what they can and can't do. And so it's a lot easier as a consultant to come in and tell them how they should do things. And it's not always realistic for them for whatever reason. Um, See, so it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tightrope in some ways because you can't just bail on them because you know they're making a bad decision or you think they're making a bad decision. But when they make a bad decision and you try to help them get out of it, it's, it's usually messier than it needs to be, or, you know, oftentimes. Uh, but if we can help them avoid some of the pitfalls, you know, they're still stepping in a lot of the pitfalls we know, you know, we, we, we don't want them to. Um, but we're, we're helping them make it less damaging or, you know, mitigate as much of the risk as we can. But, you know, a lot of times it doesn't feel good. You know, it's, it's more of a, I don't want to say our company takes a, a hit from a, from a branding or a perception or reputation perspective, because even those clients will recognize that we did our part. And usually a lot of times those are some of our better references because they, a lot of times they'll say, well, we did this and we messed this up, but they told us not to, and we still did. And in some ways, in a weird way, it builds a stronger trust because we we told them and what we told them would happen did happen. Um, so usually their relationship em, ends up okay and they end up being good references and whatnot. But a lot of times as a consultant, you just don't feel good about it because you're, you're like, man, I, you know, now I'm helping this client through this disaster. And, you know, I, I you know, sometimes you feel like you, you, you know, could you have done more to help them avoid it? Or, you know, you sort of share, you take on a lot of that blame, even though it wasn't your decision. So it's more, I'd say it's more of a, feeling, you know, individual feeling sort of uh, hit that you take more so than like credibility issues with our company or anything like that. So Eric, this has been fantastic. Um, we still have the slide with your LinkedIn uh, address up on one of our screens here. Uh, definitely everybody connect in. Uh, let's have a uh, some appreciation. For yeah, thank you. I've heard in a long time, Eric. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. Those are really good questions, by the way. This is yes. one, of the more, one of the more active classes I've talked to, um, yes, inclu too. including your last one. Uh, the last time I spoke to your class, it was not nearly this uh, engaged. Yeah. So that's, that's a good that sign. That was a grad class, too. This is undergrad. They, they did this very well. So motivated bunch. Maybe you'll be seeing some of them one of these days. Yes, if you're a motivated bunch, reach out to me because we are always looking for entry level consultants that can help. Great. Uh, so um, I will be in contact with you, Eric, and um, appreciate your time and uh, have a good rest of your day. Yep, you too. Thank you all. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.